we have returned. It's Liga and Lock Aaron and Mark here with you beauties doing another little bit of a T1 slash SKT shout out countdown where we are going through every single top laner in the history of the organization, give them a, giving them a nice little ranking. And we got we got over 10 players that have started at least a handful of games in the top lane and a lot of them for other organizations would be the best top laner in their history. It's it's crazy looking through T1 and realizing kind of what a special case T1 and SKT, that legacy of the organization is, where you can do these type of lists and really go through these players. I think maybe, you know, if we're looking, you know, in our own backyards, LCS and LEC, you're talking maybe G2, Cloud9, or type of teams that you can have these conversations about, but nowhere near those type of lists is something like this for T1 where you're talking about the pedigree, the success, the championships of these lineups, of these players. That's what it's all about. And we're talking about the tippity top of the lap looking into top lane. Starting with two guys who didn't play a ton of games, but still had an impact and their time on T1 more had an impact for their careers afterwards. We're talking about Profit and Roach. Profit in less than 15 games, you feel like this is why he got an opportunity in the LEC to be a starter. How many times when he was over in Europe did you hear them talk about former SKT top laner Profit? Yeah, and it was always one of these ones where it kind of felt that that former SKT player was taking a lot more precedent than just the name of Profit and what you were seeing on the Rift type of thing. Someone that really did benefit, at least in that little bit, from that added association from that time. And then I think when you look at Roach, a player that obviously had his highs, but he also had quite a few lows during his time with T1 individual. And obviously he was primarily a backup and one of the many players who eventually became a coach in that T1 organization. So even guys who were not even playing double-digit starts, they just want to be a part of... The T1 organization, because they're the best of the best, and as we've seen time and time again, T1 looks after their own. T1 does. Everybody loving to stay home, especially now with Mr. Joe Marsh at the top of the top, keeping things in line for T1. Yes, going to run into a couple more of these if you see in the other positions as well. Then you get into the actual rankings where guys played significant amount of games, and there's not many but there is a dark age of top laners in the LCK for T1. And unfortunately, first we're looking at Mr. Antara, who was the recipient of a whole lot of flack and flame, ended up becoming one of the most entertaining streamers in Korea under that T1 banner. But on Rift LCK matches... He was often put in some uh, unfair circumstance. I love that you mentioned that he is of doing really well as a streamer for the T1 uh, organization because, yes, that is the sunshine at the end. There was not a lot of sunshine during those playing days, Mr. Ntara, and what was going on with T1. Hardly the only issue when I think we can look back at those T1 rosters and what was going wrong for the team. A, pl a player that, you know, really struggled to find their momentum, to find what the groove was, and especially to even match up to what the meta was at the time during those years. And, you know, he was kind of more the tank duty. He even, he played some games over Hooney in some of the, I think the 2017 summer finals, he played some games. Then he transitioned into 2018, which we know was the worst year of all time for the SKT organization. And, the spot ahead of him, batting in number eight, is Tall, who was also splitting some time with Ontera. And the reason that he's a little bit higher, one spot higher, is I feel like Tall was more of an avenue and win condition, even though there weren't many win conditions for 2018 SKT. We forget that that year, even Faker was not even close to playing at his highest level, and Tall was time and time again put on a lot of these carry top laners. As essentially a rookie, he was really thrown into the fire. He was, and I guess the unfortunate thing for him is you can look at the history of T1 and find rookies that are thrown into the fire and immediately get that success. Immediately That was start much better T1 rosters than get. <laughs> Absolutely. There's other factors that do play into that type of one, and you look at players like Antara and like Tall, they are not afforded those type of luxuries into their situation. 
Tall, as you mentioned, playing a little bit more of the carries. You're looking at something, you know, you're thinking about the Vladimir. He was running around a 70, 71% win rate. You know, a couple things around that 65, 66 range. You're looking Kennan, Aatrox, those type of more traditional options, especially in that response to where you would look at with Antara. You'd be rolling through some Orn, Scion, Nar, those type of options for him. And, and man, there were some unfortunate Orn games. I think I'll, I'll leave it as that to say for Antara. Thal, I think a little bit better memories, a little bit stronger. You overall look at that record. It's somewhere around, you know, a, a 40 and 40 type of split between win and loss for someone like Thal, which, you know, for a lot of other players can be pretty decent in their career and success wise, but I ain't cutting it when you're talking about what it takes to be on this type of list for a T1 top laner. The potential was obviously there, though, because he got that Hanwha Life starting gig after that as a featured guy on there. Seven on this list is where we rev it up because really Tal and Antar are the only guys you're looking at and not feeling great about. It feels harsh even putting Kana in this number seven spot. Number one, because the sheer amount of games he actually played with T1. And I know there were some moments where people wanted him benched. But as a young player coming in, there were still so many highs for him. Yeah, this is a player that was rocking over 60% win rate for T1, and especially considering, keep in mind, how fresh, how inexperienced, how young a player he was hyped up to be one of these emerging top lane prodigies, someone that would, you know, develop into that Marin legacy type of guy that we'll talk about. Of course, there's no secret that he is one of the gods of T1 top lane. That's what Kana was looking up to be, trying to be in that type of potential. And I think obviously to that standard, didn't quite get to that ultimate high, but still an incredibly successful and impactful time in what now we can identify really is that turning of the gears, that starting up again of the T1 dynasty, of that T1 engine. And again, we talk about the musical chairs era in 2020, start of 2021 for T1 and Kana was the guy who wasn't getting subbed out very much. It was kind of everybody but him and Kyria that were getting swapped out. And he, I hesitate to call him fully consistent because there were still games where he was dying randomly. He was just a classic top lane. He's either getting a solo kill or he's getting solo killed. Uh, there was a lot of NAR action going on, a lot of Kennen games that you would see, and still pretty darn successful around, you know, 70 or so win rate on those type of champions. But we did get to see this was start of that turnaround for T1, where they really did again emerge as one of these top options in the LCK. And you could see that strength of that solo laner in the top side being a determining factor in how they wanted to play, how the power was going to be in the hands of T1. Kana is a really good piece to look at and absolutely a mega step up from where we've already talked about in this list. Top six is where you get the legit icons of the top lane, not just for SKT, but you're talking all-time status for most of these guys. And we start with Hooney, even though he only had one year with SKT in 2017. No question through the Spring Split and MSI, this guy was living up to the hype, but fresh off of smashing the LCS with Immortals. And even though... I mean, it's a disappointing world when SKT lose in the grand finals of all things. But there was no question that Huni was the second best player for this squad throughout the entire world championship. And let's just take a moment to appreciate how magnificent and how wonderful a year it was really for Huni. Of course, it ends in that sour note with that finals. But you look at the whole thing of the year and how he performed, how he was able to excel in the LCK answered a lot of the doubters, a lot of people that said his accomplishments in the LEC, his time in the LCS, who the hell cares? That stuff doesn't matter. LCK, my man put up when it got to be the time. He made sure that a lot of things got done for T1. He was able to perform at that top level in the top league at the time. Unbelievable rumble performances, but you wouldn't have thought Pretty darn high, 87 or so percent win rate on that Maokai back there in that time. You're throwing a little back to this guy was about a 67, 70 percent type of win rate for T1. Incredible stuff from Huni, especially to prove a lot of the doubters wrong in joining T1 and finding that success. Obviously, a lot of lessons also still had to be learned that year from him. I think he talked quite a bit about how much he would hear from uh, Koma about improving or maybe practicing a little bit harder. Yeah, we know how different that uh, 
coaching style is in Korea versus Europe or North America. But the biggest thing to note was both MSI and Worlds, there was a top gap more often than not when it came to that top side of the map because Hooney was piloting whatever it was, even a NAR, a Jace, a Rumble. He was taking games over time and time again for SKT. So one full year, all you needed to know that Hooney absolutely lived up to the hype. Not enough to go over Big Daddy or Grand Daddy Impact, who becomes a little bit harder to rank because 2013, even 2014, was such a different competitive scene with how underdeveloped things still were. But no question, Impact was Mr. Consistent on SKT, even when they struggled a bit in 2014. Oh, baby, Mr. T1 Singed. Yes, sir. We are talking about the granddaddy, Mr. Impact. And, and you're right. It is one of these ones where it is such an incredible uh, you know, duration and length of his career longevity that we are having to have this type of turn back to time, really refresh and look back and separate into that T1 era. It is so early. It is so different. You know, we talked about that before looking at the T1 list, how you can evaluate and, and quantify the different eras and, and quality of games in League of Legends and how it moved on. Impact is obviously a much earlier time, but the role that he played, the type of disruption that he was for other teams, make no mistake, absolutely, the impact that we all know and love today was forged in that early days of the SKT dynasty. And you were never... I mean, this has stayed true his whole career, but again, we're looking at specifically his time on SKT. Never were you worried about him in a lane matchup. Never was he a liability. Throughout his career, he hasn't been the solo kill king MVP level takeover games as a top laner, but he is as consistent as they come on that top lane island. And a spot ahead of him is a guy who is, I'm going to say it, the most underrated top laner in the history of T1. He's a world champion. He's an MSI champion. It is Duke in the top lane. And maybe it's because Peak Smeb was around this time in 2016. There weren't as many carry top laners coming out. But Duke is like the evolved form of impact where he was never going to lose a lane. Maybe he's not going to take over in 1v9 on this SKT run, but he was unbelievably reliable. Yeah, you know, and I don't want to do this to Duke because, again, he is incredible. He almost feels like the evolved forms of Tall and Untara combined is what you were able to get from a player like Duke because he could offer you some of those carry champions at the time, but absolutely a player that I think excelled much more so towards that tank side, but still had a flair to get a little bit spicy, to give you a little bit of that action. And you're right, overshadowed by a player like Smeb, which I mean, you can put that in a lot of players categories type of things and what type of player what you know star level he brought at the time and especially what the scene was like at the time to be a star at that type of level duke did deliver no question about it for t1 you look through that success you look at those championships you look at the performances on things like that maokai of course on the signature tank echo up in that top side got that skin for it love it that's my first pentakill is on the skt echo got that special part in my heart thank you base mr duke for getting mark uh that pentakill you know poppy trundle all these other tank type picks that he may not look like a tank honestly doing 1v3s around baron or taking games over at times even on these tank picks so let's put some respect on duke in that number four spot then we slide into the big boys in the top three, the revamp, retool, revitalize era of 2019, and that is SKT Khan coming onto the rift, picking up Riven, picking up Quinn. It is still a tragedy that this guy does not have a world championship and didn't get to a finals with SKT, but he absolutely lived up to the hype from start to finish in 2019. I know it's not, you know, it, it'll cover a little bit about it, but I'll tell you, after this one, go do yourself a favor. Go watch the G-Bay documentary about Khan and what type of player he was, because if you need that refresher, you are in for an unbelievable treat in what this guy's career was. And of course, part of that career is his time with T1 and that stay in that run, which I think a lot of people will look at. And, you know, I think there's a lot of other things to say about the run that is stopped by the G2 Samurai. Man, what a run that could have been and what a year it could have been with Khan rolling through in that top side. 
a hundred percent win rate on the fiora that is the con that we all know and love those type of champions the aatrox you throw them in there graves as well my man is a beast up in the top side. lots of carries that he was pulling out in the top lane obviously the ribbon pick came around he was dismantling griffin not once but twice in the finals on that pick, the Fiora, as you mentioned. And remember, this guy was the original Korean Jace popping bodies around the rift. I, one of the things that I loved about Khan is there were times where it would almost feel like he was disrespecting the opponent. It'd be one of those type of things. It'd be easy to understand it or, or to take it as that. But to know Khan as a player, you realized it was just this extreme confidence in himself a lot of those times that would lead to any of these type of things that would lead like that always love a player that plays like Khan, has those type of uh, ideas and makes the special miracle plays happen like only Khan could make happen. It was infectious when you saw this dude laughing on the cams in the middle of a game, whether it's him being denied a pentakill, getting a solo kill. He was happy in one of the most stressful environments that we know of playing on this SKT organization. So again, absolutely lived up to the hype with just one year in SKT. It was one single year for Marin on SKT as well in that number two spot. This is maybe one of the first premier carry top lane years where, I mean, it's the first time you were talking about someone on SKT being better than Faker. It really is. And it's one of the only times where I think, you know what? We can talk about that happening again for T1. And it is that top laner making a difference. But of course, the first one to do so is Marin, one of the most notable, one of the most known, renowned top laners ever. And it is because of his role, his impact during that 2015 run for SKT and how transformative he really was to a lot of people in what you could see, what value you could get out of that top lane position. Man, oh man, Marin is the legend of legends for that. First top laner would ever pick up the World Finals MVP that year where they had an absolutely insane run. His win percentage, absolutely disgusting with SKT. But the biggest standout is, sure, you saw this guy 1v4ing on Fizz. You saw him making crazy outplays on Fiora, but he could do carries and tanks. We all remember that game-saving Maokai play that he did against CJ Entis. And Mark, his record on Maokai with SKT, 31 wins, one loss. A single loss in 32 games is just disgusting. And one of the things that I think that does really separate Marin from a lot of these earlier eras of League of Legends and the stars and the players that you remember from there, the clutch factor. He was so incredibly clutch, no matter what it was. If there were already things popping off for T1, Marvin's joining in on that, helping to accelerate the snowball. Things aren't going well. We need to turn it around. We need something going right. It's Marin getting it done, making sure that there is a factor that we're going to play for later on. It really is the icon, the you know thing that you want your top laner to be. A hell of a lot of old people are going to be pointing at Marin and saying, that's exactly what you need to get done. Oh, back in my day, you could play <laughs> Mount Guy and still carry games like Big Daddy Marin did in 2015. And you want to talk about carrying games. There's no top laner higher on this list, more mechanically gifted. The second, third wave of Dynasty 4T1. Yes, it is another finals MVP. Zeus, no question, still with potentially years left on this T1 roster, he's already sitting in that top spot. I think there is some type of conversation about the consistency and the clutch factors that Marin brought in that can bring him up more so in a conversation with Zeus. But unfortunately, as much as I love Marin, it gets blown out of the water when you look at some of the raw performance, the skill, the impressing, the wow factor that someone like Zeus brings to that role and his impactful nature for this T1 lineup on how he sets the pace. Absolutely no question in my mind, he has surpassed the most legendary top laner in my mind, Zeus, number one for T1. And he's the reason, you know, a guy like Kana, if he stays on T1, the trajectory of his career completely changes. But they had this Zeus guy sitting on the bench. And I remember when we were just watching his solo queue highlights, like, oh, 
this guy, if he plays even close to this in the LCK, he's going to take over. And here we are a couple years later, and uh, yeah, he took over not over the LCK, but the entire planet when you're talking about top laners. It's incredible because you outlined it right at the very beginning. You know, you go from Kana and it's an immediate step up into talking about some of the most all time great players at that top lane position. And for Kana, he could have been vaulted in that type of conversation, staying with T1 and how that path might have turned out, that development, all these type of things. Zeus is that answer. Someone that came all the way through that T1 Academy system was that unbelievable potential of a superstar fully realized on that LCK stage, on that world stage for everybody to see overcoming the demons of underperforming in the biggest of moments. My man has risen all the way from the cream of the crop to the tippity top of the LCK of that T1 top lane mount. And even when, you know, we had all the negatives about his performances in finals, again, this era of T1 was making finals in every single tournament at worst. And before those finals, he was the best top laner in the league, one of the best top laners in the world. Yes, that demon was finally destroyed in the 2023 World Championship, but I mean, mechanically what this guy can do on a plethora of different carries doesn't matter if he's in a counter matchup even in the top lane against some of the world's best. This guy is the focal point for the best team in the world. And we can't talk about Zeus without mentioning what type of impact his champion, you know, pool is. That Yone, that difference maker, what type of thing that is. And obviously, he gets a little bit of a buff compared to some of these older guys who didn't have a champion, didn't have that champion design exist to extend and push your influence on the map the way that you can with some of these champions. Zeus absolutely taking it to the max there for this T1 team. And how can we talk about also that he immediately steps into these situations where he can and did make some of those learning mistakes in these all-time big-time like moments. 17, 18 years old. Most of these guys at that point, they're getting it in maybe, oh, we're fighting for a playoff spot. Oh, we're fighting to make it to the next round of the playoffs. This is happening. He's learning on the spot. And he's only going to climb even higher as the years go and separate from the rest. But that's it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on that flippity flip.